This car is a celebration between the partnership between Japanese design and technology and British know-how and workmanship. The new Toyota Avensis is made in Derbyshire and is set to challenge the might of the Escort and Golf in this small family car sector. This week, Howard Stableford and Ian Royal review both the state and saloon versions of the Toyota Avensis. And in part two, we also drive the updated long-running Toyota Corolla. Now for me, driving and reporting on cars is a great deal of fun. There are some cars you can't wait to get out for a spin in, other cars you think, well, it's not really the sort of car for me. Now Toyota have a reputation for building very fine cars, solid and reliable, but not the sort of cars with their mass market vehicles that are going to set the world on fire. And the Carina was one such car, a car about as interesting as watching paint dry or maybe finding out what sort of sandwiches you had in your lunchbox that day. Now, the Carina's replacement is this, the all-new Avensis. Yes, I said Avensis. What does it stand for? What does it mean? We don't know, but this is the car. Now, in the six years that the Carina was around, Toyota sold 125,000 models, and this year Toyota predicts sales of the new Avensis at around 25,000. And for sure, it'll be a big player in the fleet market. And I doubt its claims that this is an upper medium class car. Toyota are running a very smooth TV ad at the moment for the Avensis, making it look very spacious and very glamorous. Well, is it? I'm not so sure. I think it's rather bland in the styling, apart from these rather snazzy headlights at the front, which a lot of car manufacturers are going for. But what's the interior like? Well, let's take a look. Now inside this 1.8 GS model, you're cosseted by airbags, quite literally. There's one for the driver, there's one for the passenger, and there's side airbags as well. And Toyota tell us that the airbags for the driver and passenger are a lot bigger than they were in the Carina. For instance, a 60 litre airbag for the driver and a 110 litre airbag for the passenger. There's also a rather snazzy CD radio cassette machine which looks rather difficult to steer, looks as though it's been made for the car in fact. That's very smart. There's an alarm, immobiliser, air conditioning and a sunroof. And what do you think about the interior in the Avensis? Well at first I thought it was rather garish but I have to say it has grown on me a little bit. This rather odd pattern on the seating but I'm still not convinced about it. And why oh why do car manufacturers insist on giving us these huge expanses of grey plastic on the dashboard? Surely, surely they could come up with something a lot better. And how about this for a touch of style, supposedly anyway on the Avensis, this so-called wood effect around the centre console. And it is purely just for effect. I don't think that has ever seen the inside of a tree. So what about the engines on the new Avensis? Well, there are four. There's a 1.6 litre 16 valve lean burn. There's this, which is the 1.8 litre 16 valve lean burn. There's a 2 litre and a 2 litre diesel. And also new to the Avensis range is a brand new ignition system, which called Toyota Direct Ignition, or TDI. It makes the engine more reliable. It reduces electromagnetic interference and also helps with ignition timing as well. Now this 1.8 litre produces 108 brake horsepower, so it's quite respectable. And I have to say, I've been driving it around for a few weeks and either it's very economical or there's something wrong with the fuel gauge because the needle has hardly moved in the past few days. It should give a combined figure of around 38 miles per gallon, a top speed of 119 miles per hour and 0 to 60 time in around 11 seconds. On the road, the car goes well, the engine revs freely, but one thing I have noticed with this car is a slight lag in the acceleration, the sort you sometimes get on turbos. Just a slight hesitation, maybe it's just on our test car, I certainly hope so for Toyota's sake. The handling is not that impressive, I have to say. Pushing the car hard through twisty country lanes makes you realise it ain't a sports car, but its brakes are good and the seating position is fine. Rear seat passengers don't fare too bad with a reasonable amount of room, plus a rather snazzy armrest that incorporates a tray and of course the customary drink holders. Toyota claim luggage space to be good for this size of car, although you might be best going for the hatchback or estate if that's critical for you. Now the Avensis is up against some very tough competitors in the form of the Mondeo, the Vectra, the Laguna and the Peugeot 406 and for me personally 
I think I'd choose one of those cars over the Avensis. Toyota can bang on forever about the great reliability and the quality and value for money that they give. All important factors, of course. But for sheer driving pleasure, I think I'd choose one of those rivals. Now, this 1.8 GS Saloon is £15,115 on the road. Great value for money. And the Avensis range starts at just under £14,000, rising to just over £20,000. You get a choice of saloon, hatchback and estate, manual or automatic, and a choice of four engines too. One big plus point though for the Avensis is the fact that this car is built here in Britain in Derbyshire. And that's great for jobs, it's great for the economy. But you just can't get away from that dull Carina image. The name of the company that makes this car is almost a palindrome for a toy yacht. Turn it the other way around and you've got a Toyota. We'll start with the good news. This is the top of the range CDX 2 litre estate. Now normally estates I think are really ugly. They're sort of saloons with a box tacked on the back. But this one is gorgeous in comparison to most of its rivals, which is a surprise because it's been designed by a Toyota Pan-European committee. Now normally, as we know, committees give us camels, but not in this case. Look at this beautifully sculpted bonnet here smoking windows and a backside that's positively pert with these beautiful wrap round large lamps that make the estate version of the Avensis look like it was properly designed from scratch. Very attractive. Full mark so far. Unfortunately, exhausted by their excellent efforts outside, this talented design team obviously took a break whilst Steve Boring Davis designed the interior. Look at this, acres of dark grey plastic, last seen on John Major's spitting image puppet. Create an atmosphere with all the appeal of a wet winter's sky over Skegness. And look, hard grey leather seats add to the atmosphere of despondence. And those sassy, smoking windows on the outside just add to the gloom on the inside. However, I believe that other interior colours are available. The Avensis is now amongst us so that the boring old Carina E no longer needs to be. It's being phased out this year. Meanwhile, Toyota have high hopes indeed for their new Rose. It's aimed at the upper-medium sector of the market, wants to be a big player on the fleet buyers list, and is supposed to appeal strongly to young families as well. The engines have been reworked to be more responsive than the Carina E. They vary from a 1.6-litre 16-valve lean burn through a 1.8 version to 2 litres. There's also a 2-litre turbo diesel engine with electronic fuel injection, drive-by-wire throttle and an intercooler. I wish they'd sent me that one to try. Acceleration has been improved at lower engine speeds in the Avensis, and there's roughly 3% better fuel efficiency over all of the four new models. Meanwhile, back in the driver's seat. It's a perfectly pleasant and easy car to drive. The seats are very comfortable, they wrap round you extremely snugly, and unlike in a lot of cars, the headrests actually come forward and rest your head. And one thing I particularly like is the view through the large rear quarter windows. Now the cheapest version of the Avensis is the S grade, but even that comes pretty loaded with things like powered front windows and mirrors, adjustable steering column, remote central locking and an immobiliser. Now this is the top of the range as I said earlier, so this one comes with a rather nice electric sunroof. It also has wood trim that clashes horribly with all the grey plastic. An extremely attractive CD tape and radio, along with a truly awful audio remote control. I mean, look at this little stubby thing down here. You need the dexterity of a magician to fumble your way around here to find anything useful. And then why bother? Because the remote controls are so handily situated near the actual controls. You know me, I like a gadget, but only if they're actually useful. 
In the bad old days, it was how fast a car could go and how quickly it could get you there that sold cars. Today, it's how many mod cons come as standard, and of course, how safe is my family going to be? Well, the Avensis does pretty well in these departments. Toyota claims that this has the best safety features in its class. Driver and passenger airbags, of course. Front seat side airbags are standard too. What's more, the front airbags are larger than in the Carina. Anti-lock brakes are standard, better seat belt mechanisms, and reinforced rear seat backs to stop flying luggage becoming a pain in the back. All good stuff. Talking of luggage, I've decided to stop here to show you how flexible things are in the back. Oh, and by the way, these luggage rails are standard on the CDX. For a start, there's a deceptively large amount of space in the back here, and that's because it's opened out at the sides behind the rear wheel arches to give extra width. There are clasps in here to batten your luggage down, and this is rather neat too. Simple cover to hide your valuables that clips in the back. And that's also very easy to remove. A couple of levers there, and the whole thing, very light, just lifts out. And that's also true of this fabric luggage guard here that simply unclasps too. Meanwhile, in the back seats, lots of space, good leg room down here because the front seats have been sculpted out to give you extra room for your knees. And there's great flexibility here too. Basically, these seats can be very simply pushed down. Oh, hello. And then the back seat just pops forward like that and the headrest comes out. Extra flexibility, extra length there. And the same on the other side. But before I show you that, there's a nice piece of storage space there. Put your drinks, a little few nibbles there. But otherwise, this seat does just the same. Clips, forward it goes. You take the backrest off and then you've got acres of space. Rather clever. Overall, I like the design of this estate car, but it's not going to light any fires in the motoring world. It's a good machine, but its performance is as dull as the interior planes of plastic. The Aventa 2.0-litre CDX estate does 0-60 in about 10 seconds, has a top speed of 125 miles an hour and an average fuel consumption of 33 mpg, and it costs just under £20,000. The bottom of the range S grade starts at 14,000. Now Toyota compares prices and specs with rivals like the Vectra, the Mondeo and the Peugeot 406 and the Avensis comes out on top quite easily. However, at the time I was road testing, the Avensis was in a higher insurance class than the others because Toyota hadn't got round to sending the assessors a car to assess. Now that's one drawback I'm sure they'll remedy straight away. After the break, the car file will open on another Toyota model that was designed by a pan-European committee, the latest version of the extremely popular Toyota Corolla. The image of the Corolla is one of solid reliability and value for money, one that you'd expect from the world's best-selling car. So the temptation must be for Toyota to stick with what works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right?
Corolla has uh, held its position as the world's best-selling car really because of the number of times that it's been changed and improved over the years. And that is a process that uh, continues to this day and the latest model takes Corolla 2 uh, another step uh, forward uh, in terms of technical specification and uh, the uh, feature and equipment on the vehicle. The Corolla um, has been a world car for a long period of time, uh, but again, the evolution process for Corolla has led it in three different directions, and tastes in different parts of the world vary. We now have uh, a version for the Japanese domestic market and for Asia, and also one for North America, and the one that we've just introduced, the new European Corolla, which is uh, engineered and designed very much for the European motoring needs. Body styles available in the new Corolla. A three-door hatchback, an estate, a saloon, and this, a five-door liftback, which they think will be the best-selling model. Add this to the various engine and trim levels, and you'll really be stuck for choice from the 21 Corollas that will be available to us in the UK. Toyota haven't made the mistake of putting all their effort into fantastic exterior styling and forgetting all about the interior, banging it in as an afterthought. They've actually made a really good job of it. Gone is the beloved black plastic of so many Japanese manufacturers, replaced by lighter, brighter interior that comes in a whole array of choices. And boy, does it really make a difference. Obviously the uh, Corolla already, ha already has many, many strengths, uh, but we have heard that uh, a little bit of uh, fun, a little bit more uh, driving excitement um, uh, would be appreciated by our owners, and that's something we've tried to deliver with the new model. Uh, the suspension has been changed, uh, obviously the style as well of the vehicle overall uh, has been uh, made more interesting from the uh, consumer's point of view. Some of the fabrics inside, the design elements, um, altogether more lively, uh, we think more fun overall, certainly more fun to drive. position is also extremely comfortable. Steering wheel well laid out and the seats are nice and firm. And I've heard no complaints from anybody about the amount of space inside the cabin, which is far greater than it was last time around. Well, I think in Europe uh, we're more emotionally involved with our cars. Uh, we, we like them obviously to be uh, reliable and economical and good value, but we also like style and flair and uh, in certain markets as well a little passion too. And that's something that we've tried to build in to the new Corolla and we think we've been successful. 
First of all, we have a thing called the design panel, uh, and that is made up of representatives of the Toyota companies in Europe. Now, we're obviously quite close to the marketplace. We know what our customers want, and we've tried to reflect that very much in the design, and we've helped the Japanese designers understand the requirements of the European market. Now, the other aspect, of course, is research, which is very, very important, and the new Corolla was researched in Europe as well, so that we could be sure that we got it absolutely right for Euro European motorists. certainly very different this time around and makes for an extremely distinctive car and traditional Corolla drivers may be a little shocked but love it or hate it you will have an opinion on it there can be no accusations this time that the Corolla looks bland its success has been built on a very methodical approach of improvement, um, always improving on a solid base and that again is the trend that uh, has been continued with the new model. There have been many, many improvements but we've also kept what was good about Crawler, particularly the strength, the safety, uh, the reliability. These are attributes that our owners currently appreciate and we don't want to lose any of that. So um, there's the old saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it and the Crawler is definitely not broken and we've just improved it as we've uh, introduced the new model. I think uh, all cars all modern cars have moved on a great deal from the from the early days the days of the 60s when the crawler was first introduced uh, and uh, it is a radically different car absolutely no doubt that this time it's a much better car than the old version. It may not be bursting with style and it doesn't excite and thrill too much behind the wheel. But let's face it, the Toyota Corolla is never going to do that. That's not why it's already sold around 24 million vehicles worldwide. What you do have here is still reliable, it's well built, it offers excellent value for money with a high level of specification. And I've no doubt that it's a car that will have no problems pushing those already enviable sales figures even higher. Mm -hmm.